Of course, it's important that we not only can construct confidence intervals for two independent proportions with a calculator, but we can also read outputs and fill in blanks and analyze those outputs. So let's read this. A medical researcher wants to determine if a new type of surgical procedure will lower the need for post-operative pain medication. She gathers data on a random sample of patients undergoing the standard procedure, group 1, and then another random sample of patients undergoing the new procedure, group 2. She finds out how many patients in each group required post-operative pain medication, then constructs a confidence interval, and the results are shown below. And of course, I've blacked out some of those results just to mess with you. All right, so you can see here it says it's making a test and a confidence interval, CI, for two proportions. And I've um, blotted some stuff out here that we're going to have to calculate. And I sort of have this backwards, I apologize, but let's start with letter B. We're going to compute P2 hat. But if you remember, P2 hat is X2 over N2, and X2 and N2 are given 16 and 90. So all we need to do is take 16 and divide it by 90, and we have 0.17 repeating. So that would be P2 hat. There we go. All right, now X1 is a little bit trickier. You're going to use the same formula, but you need to solve it for X1, the variable we don't know. So let's see here. I put in that P1 is equal to X1 over N1. Then I say 0.3 is equal to X1 over 50, which means to work this out, I'm going to need to multiply by 50 to both sides. Right, so I, I do it on the left, and I'm going to have to do it on the right. And over here, of course, these values, the 50 and the 50, are going to cancel, which is why you're doing it. And that'll leave you x1 is equal to whatever 50 times 0.3 is. Right. So I grab the calculator, 50 times 0.3 makes 15. That's what I thought it was anyway, because 3 times 5 is 15, but I didn't want to just pull that out of nowhere. All right, so x1 equals 15. All right, so we'll box that since that's our answer. And there we have it. All right, now step two, or part Oh, part C, excuse me. Verify that the requirements needed to construct a confidence interval were met. Well, the requirements to construct the interval are the same as the requirements for the hypothesis test. Let me scroll back up here. You need to have independent simple random samples. N times P times 1 minus P has to be greater than 10. And the samples need to be independent and all that. It's the same that's written here for the 2-prop-Z test is the same as for the 2-prop-Z interval. They're the same thing, the same requirements. Okay, so let's go back here. So we need these to be simple random samples, but I believe that's given oop, right here. So it says that it's a random sample of patients right there. So that'll help us out. And then another random sample right here. And they're completely separated. So they're independent, simple random samples, no trouble. All right, so those are given to us. There, given in the problem. Then we need n times p times 1 minus p to be greater than 10 for both groups. So we are going to have to check that. So let's find this. We had n1 was 50. So I need 50 times 0.3 times 1 minus 0.3. So 50 times 0 0.3, parentheses, 1 minus 0 0.3, 10.5. So just barely on that one. So that one's 10.5, but it is, in fact, bigger than or equal to 10, so we're good. And then 90 times 0.7, excuse me, 90 times 0 0.17777, that's pretty good, times parentheses 1 minus 0 0.17777. I could also use the fractions. I'll get about 13.2. And 13.2 is, in fact, bigger than 10, so we're good. So I'm just rounding a little bit here. All right. All right, good there. 
And the last part, we're just going to kind of wave our hands out a little bit. This probably isn't a fabulous assumption on our parts, but we are going to assume that um, N1 is 50 and N2 is 90 or less than 5% of all the people in the world receiving the surgery, whatever it is. Of course, if this is a rare surgery, that's not a fair assumption to make here. But if we don't make this assumption, we can't proceed. So we're just going to assume um, that this is the case. Again, not a great assumption, but what, what else can we do? All right, next, we're supposed to state the confidence level. Well, let's go back. We've got to look for some confidence level in here somewhere. And right over here, it says 96% CI. That's your confidence level. And I'm going to give it a bright blue box so we can see it because it also is going to want us to find, actually, let me put it, I only need the blue box around the 96%. All right, so let me use that, and then I'm going to use that to find my level of significance as well. So my confidence level is 96%. There we have it, 96%. And that means our level of significance will be 1 minus that. So that would be 0 0.04. Remember, because confidence level and alpha are complements of each other. So now we need to find the critical value. Well, it's been a while since we've done that. Let's go back and look at critical values. Um, I'm going to look at them for a two-tailed test because a two-tailed test is the same as for a confidence interval. Um, two-tailed tests are interested in the tails and confidence intervals are interested in the center, but they use the same critical values, which is plus or minus Z alpha over 2. So I'm going to need to draw a picture with alpha over 2. So that would be 0 0.04 over 2, which is 0 0.02 on both tails. And then I need to find the Z scores for that. There we go. Now MinTab's telling us that it's 2.054, but I'm going to prove it one way or the other. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. If alpha is 0.04, that means that alpha over 2 is 0.02. So we would use inverse norm or the T table. So if the oh, 0.02 is in the T table, let me show it to you. Oop, I went too far. I'm sorry. One second. There we go. So 0.02 right there. The bottom row is 2.054. There's your z-score. Or you can get it with inverse norm, if you recall, which is above your distribution, so or distribution above your variables button. So it's inverse norm, which is number 3, 0.02, and then 0 and 1. So just go down to paste and press enter, and press enter, and you get negative 2.054. And that's the value on the left. The table gives the value on the right, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, either way, you'll find that your answer, and they only want the positive value here. The critical value Z alpha over 2 is actually the one on the right. Oops, that's mislabeled. I just realized that should be alpha over 2 there. There, I fixed that. So it says alpha over 2 for each of those. And there we go. We found the critical values. That was, if you recall, a topic we first learned in Chapter 7. So we've used it a lot since then. All right, now this is something we first learned about in Chapter 9, so we're just going to kind of review. So we want to explain the relationship between the confidence level and the width of the interval. So let me remind you of a couple things. Um, the width of the interval is double the error, and the error is the back half of the formula. So when you look at this big formula, this right here is your margin of error. It's at half the width of your interval. So if you make your error larger, you're going to make your confidence interval larger. And if your error is larger, um, the question is, how would that work with your confidence level? So I typed it all up here. So if you look at the formula, you can see that width is equal to twice your error, and that's twice of that big, huge formula. And you don't really care about the big, huge formula. It just, just suffices to say it's really big. So increasing the confidence level will increase the z alpha over 2 to a larger number. And that will cause the error and width and width to increase as well. You know, I think I just cleaned that up just a little bit here. Increasing your confidence level increases your z alpha over 2, and that causes the margin of error 
as well as the size and width of the interval to become larger. In other words, margin of error, size, width of an interval, and the confidence interval are all directly related to each other. And I kind of wrote over here on the side just a little bit of a logical thing. Look, if you want to be more confident, to be more sure that you're catching the true difference in the parameters, then you need to fish with a bigger net, i.e. use a bigger interval. Right? More confidence means bigger interval. Less confidence, so if you want to increase your confidence, you want a bigger interval. Okay. And we first learned about all of this in chapter 9. Where we talked at length about how the error and the width go together and they move hand in hand with the confidence level. If your confidence level goes up, your margin of error goes up. They're directly related. That's what a direct relationship means. If one goes up, so does the other. And vice versa, if one goes down, so does the other. All right, now the confidence interval itself is, let's see, point, negative, point zero three four, negative point zero three five and point two seven nine. So let me see if I type that up. I just did three decimal places. I changed my mind on that. Now the point estimate is the center, the smack dab center of that interval. So you need to add up the two values and divide by two. I drew a little picture here. So remember the error is on one side and the other error is on the other side. And the very, very middle is the two numbers added up and divided by two. So if I take my calculator, I take negative 0 0.035 plus 0 0.279. And I add them up, I get 2, 0.244 and I divide by two, I get 0.122. So that would be the point estimate because it's the center of my interval. Now you weren't asked to find it, but the error is the distance from the edge to the center. So it's half the width. So you would find the width 0.279, take away negative 0.035, in other words, add 0.035, and divide by 2, and you would find your error. Now, does this confidence interval suggest that there is a significant difference between the two procedures in terms of post-operative pain medication usage? Medication, not mediation. Sorry about that. Okay, so the answer to that is no, not really, because if there was going to be a significant difference, then zero would not be in the interval. But zero is in the interval, right? So remember that in this chapter, if I, if I go back to look at the inferential statistics sheet, Here's the two prop Z test that we're looking at here. And you can see that the null hypothesis is always that P1 is equal to P2. And if that's the case, then when you subtract them, you'll always have zero. All right, but zero is not in our interval, right? Oh, excuse me, zero is in our interval, I apologize. So zero is right here in the middle of our interval. And since zero is in the interval, that implies there is not a significant difference because we're not able to disprove this null hypothesis that we assume to be true. If you want to be significantly different from zero, then zero shouldn't be in your interval. All right, we're all done with looking at that problem. And then I'll see you back here to talk about sample size for proportions for two proportions, as a matter of fact.